Hi friends, welcome to Beautifully Bookish Bethany. In today's video, I'm gonna be talking about all the books that I read in the first half of October. When I first opened this, I said September, and then I was like, no, it is not September, it is October. <laughs> So far October has been an interesting reading month. I have had more five stars than usual, but also more two stars than usual and fewer books in between. So I feel like most often I have a lot of like three to four star reads and a few on the edges, whereas this month that has not been the case. I've had a lot of books that I've really been loving and I've had more than usual books that I've not been such a fan of. So we're going to talk about the books that I've read so far this month. It is a little bit less than usual, partly because of New York Comic Con. That was like four of my days and I barely read, which is totally fine. It's always a part of my October, but I've still gotten through a pretty good amount of reading. So far in October I have read 13 books. We're to talk about all of them. And if you're new to my mid-month wrap-ups, the way that these work is I talk about the books that I read in chronological order. At the end of the month, I'll do my big wrap-up with my stats and talk about books from lowest rated to highest rated, but for the purposes of this video, I'm just going to be talking about books in the order that I read them. Unfortunately, we did not start the month off very strong. I am sad to say I wasn't the biggest fan of Bring on the Blessings by Beverly Jenkins. Now, I am a huge fan of Beverly Jenkins' historical romances, but uh, this book makes me think that maybe her contemporary work is less for me. This also I think in some ways just hasn't aged very well and I wouldn't be shocked if she even agreed with that knowing what I see from her on Twitter. Bring on the Blessings came out in 2009 and while I had heard of it as a contemporary romance I would say that this is actually more women's fiction with some romantic subplots. It follows a wealthy divorcee who decides to save a historically black town by buying it and then turning it into a haven for foster children. And so it's following her, it's following some of the characters in the town, and also following these foster children. And while I really appreciate the project of this book of trying to you know, shine a light on this very real issue of the experience of children in the foster care system. Ultimately, this book didn't totally work for me. I didn't care as much about a lot of the characters, and also it had a lot of minor things that I think just don't hold up really great. There's some kind of fat phobic stuff towards one of the kids. There are some more traditional views about what is appropriate for teen girls to be wearing and you know kind of like managing how they present themselves. There's a lot of like respectability politics, you know, and and I will say too that while this is drawing attention to an important issue, definitely given the traumatic backgrounds of these children, <laughs> there's actually very little conflict. And I mean, given the kind of book that this is, it's not shocking that everything is kind of easily resolved. Their trauma doesn't affect them as deeply as probably would in real life. Um, yeah, ultimately, this was just okay. I gave it two stars. I didn't dislike it, but there were some things that didn't really hold up. And on top of it, I just wasn't that drawn in. So while I really, really love Beverly Jenkins historicals, I am thinking based on this, maybe her contemporaries aren't for me. If you have read some of her other contemporaries, like more recent ones, and you think they get better, I guess let me know. But yeah, sadly, this was a little bit of a disappointment. Then I read The Empress of Time by Kylie Lee Baker. This I had as an audio review copy from NetGalley. It is the second book in a YA fantasy duology. I read the first book last year and I enjoyed it, so I decided to request this one. And I liked it. I didn't enjoy it as much as the first book. I think it makes some kind of odd choices in that this is set 10 years after the events of book one, which makes the pacing a little strange. But I still liked it and I do think it offers a pretty satisfying conclusion to the duology. So if you enjoyed book one, it's definitely worth picking up book two, even if I thought it was not quite as good. The series is a darker YA fantasy that is drawing on Japanese mythology, so it's got some horror elements to it. And what's interesting about it is one of the through lines through both books is this issue of biracial identity and not feeling like you fit anywhere. Our main character is half British Reaper, half Japanese Shinigami. And and uh, yeah, things do get quite dark, so be aware of that. But I liked this. I gave it three and a half stars and rounded up to four on Goodreads. 
Then I read a couple of books for Black Aweenathon, which unfortunately were a little bit disappointing, and I am bummed because I had been saving them specifically for this and had really high hopes. And you know, they weren't bad, they were fine, but not quite what I was hoping for. First up, I read The Women Could Fly by Megan Giddings. I had this as an audio review copy from Libra FM, and I was excited to pick this up because I read Lakewood by Megan Giddings last year, I think, and I loved it. I thought it was a really cool debut horror novel. And this is her second book. And you know, it's not bad. I gave it three stars. So I didn't dislike it. But I think I went into this hoping that, oh, maybe this will be a new favorite or something I'm really gonna love. And it just didn't quite do that. I I don't know. This book is interesting because is one that's almost more frustrating than a book that's just bad because it's a book that was fine but had so much potential to be better and I think that is for for my brain at least like almost more frustrating and I think part of it is that while there were some parts of this book that were excellent I think me and the author maybe disagree on what those parts are because that's not what was leaned into. This is kind of like a, a witchy handmaid's tale type book, which I feel like we've gotten a lot of those in recent years. This one is queer. Our main character is a bisexual black woman. Love the bisexual representation. I think that that's great. I also think that this fraught mother-daughter relationship that is a big deal in the book is executed really well. That was for sure a strength of it, but the pacing was a little bit strange. There was like info dumpy world building toward the beginning of the book, which I didn't love. And then I just think this spent a lot of time focusing on elements that didn't feel super fresh. They felt like things that we've read in a lot of other sort of near future dystopian feminist books, which is what I would say that this falls into. Not a bad book, worth picking up. I think it has some interesting things to say. I also think that I haven't seen a lot of books in this genre that are specifically centering the Black experience. So there, there are positive things here. It was just disappointing because I think it had the potential to be something really incredible and it, it you know, it like didn't totally deliver that. But I gave it three stars. Three stars is I liked it, but I didn't love it and I was a little bummed. Then I listened to Like a Sister by Kelly Garrett. This is another one that I had as an audio influencer copy from Libro FM, and I was excited to pick this up too because I don't see a ton of crime fiction and murder mysteries written by black women, and that's what this was. I, but yeah, this was, this was okay. I feel like maybe for somebody who's just getting into the genre, this might work out better. Um, I don't know. I feel bad. <laughs> I kind of feel bad being more negative about both of these books because I picked up both of them <laughs> for this readathon. Uh, and, I, you know, like I think the book I'm reading right now for it is so far going much better. So, like, fingers crossed, I'll have better luck with that. So, this is kind of a mystery thriller set in New York City, mostly in the Bronx, following a young woman who's estranged half-sister has died under mysterious circumstances and she is kind of investigating. I think sometimes this book did some interesting things in terms of its focus on these complex family relationships, on the importance of the main character's identity as a black woman, on regret and forgiveness and things like that I think it does some interesting things with. However, the mystery part fell a little bit flat for me. The main character did a lot of things that didn't always make a lot of sense that I feel like she was kind of forced to do to progress the story forward. It didn't always make a lot of sense like why she did the things she did. Also the ultimate reveal of who the killer was just came very out of left field and again didn't make a lot of sense. So unfortunately, I ended up giving this one two stars. It was another one that was just okay. There were elements here that I liked, but the mystery piece of it didn't really work for me. Again, maybe for somebody who's just getting into the mystery genre, this could work better. Then I had several five-star reads in a row, which was very exciting. First up, I 
finally got myself together and read some Christina C. Jones. I know Ashley at Bookish Realm is a huge fan of hers and I have been meaning to read one of her romances for a while. I finally did. I listened to Getting Schooled and I loved it. It was fantastic. This is so much what I like in my romance. It does a good job of having strong character work, having social commentary, but also being fun and light and steamy. And that is definitely what you get here. The setup for this was a fun one. Our heroine is working for her mom as a graduate assistant in one of her college courses and the hero is one of the students. He's a non-traditional student so he's a little bit older and the two of them kind of hit it off. I really enjoyed this. I liked a lot of the commentary. I loved seeing their relationship. I also think she did a really good job of showing the development of the relationship over time, showing both of them work through some of their hang-ups and baggage and then as a fun bonus it ends up that their parents start dating. So I thought that this was a last. I really loved it. I gave it five stars. No complaints for me and I for sure plan to pick up more Christina C. Jones in the future. Then I read The Unbalancing by R.B. Lemberg. This was sent to me for review from the publisher. They're a small press that does some select sci-fi fantasy books and they tend to publish really good stuff. This is no different. I loved this. This was so good and so unique. I don't know that I have ever read anything quite like this before. Apparently the author has written other things in the Birdverse, but I've never read any of their work previously. This was my first introduction to them. It is a queer fantasy novel that is pretty character driven, I would say, and creates this fascinating world. The writing itself is really lovely. The story is interesting, but it's very much driven by the characters. And we have two main characters. In this world, the people worship the bird. A bird is kind of their goddess. It's also a queer norm world. They have male, female, and non-binary. Binary. There are five different variants of non-binary identities which you can figure out which one you are if you like and they show it by wearing certain animal charms in their hair, which is kind of cool. One of our main characters is queer, non-binary, and neurodiverse, and our other main character is a pansexual woman. So there is this really lovely kind of slow burn romance that does a lot of incredible work of showing the challenges of a relationship between people who are opposites in terms of how they function in a relationship, what they need from the world, and people who maybe might have misunderstandings, not intentionally. But all of this is also happening <laughs> as their entire future is at risk because their island is fed by the energy of this star that is sleeping in the sea underneath them. But the star is having nightmares and it's creating these really violent earthquakes and they're trying to find a way to save their island home. I loved this. I'm not going to say anything else about this, but it was so good. The writing was incredible. The character work was great. The world building was fascinating. And just the way that relationships and people are depicted is so well done. Easy five stars for me, and I will for sure read more from this author in the future. Next, I read The Trouble with Peace by Joe Abercrombie. Leanna and I have been doing a year-long read-along for all of the first law books, and they just keep getting better. This one was fantastic. I really loved it. I gave it five stars. I liked it even better than A Little Hatred, which I gave four and a half stars. I mean, Oh my gosh, Abercrombie is so good. He is really amazing at character work. He does some really smart things in this. And I just love, love, love the way that he writes female characters in this series, especially Savine is my favorite. I think she's incredible and so well depicted. I love the way that he writes characters who are kind of showing the problems with toxic masculinity, there's just, there's a lot to unpack here and I am so excited to see where it's gonna end in the wisdom of crowds. So if you wanna hear detailed thoughts on this, Leanna and I just recorded a podcast episode at Chapter 3 Podcast, which is linked down below. And Tuesday, October 18th, our episode for The Trouble with Peace will go up. It includes a spoiler and non-spoiler section and we had a lot to say about it. So if you wanna hear more thoughts, go and check that out. But this was five stars, I loved it. 
it was great. Then I read a book that I figured would probably be a five star read for me and I was not wrong. This author just does not miss for me. I, I have to tell you I am probably not unbiased. Her books are just entirely my thing and they may not be for everybody but I love them so much. This is Shipwrecked by Olivia Dade. Oh my god I freaking love this series. Honestly all three books in this series have been five stars. Actually that's not true. The first two books were six stars which is a favorite of the year. Shipwrecked didn't quite hit that for me but it's still easily a five star read for me. I adore the way Olivia Day does fat representation. I love her heroes. I love her humor. I love the way that she balances rom-coms with more serious issues and Shipwrecked was fantastic. Me and Izzy from Happy For Now were super lucky to get to sit down and chat with her for like an hour about this, about the way that she writes, again for Chapter 3 podcast, so keep an eye out. That episode will be airing in mid-November when Shipwrecked is actually coming out. I was lucky enough to be sent an early copy from Avon for review and it was so good. If you haven't yet, you could go pre-order this. Um, what can I say about it? One thing that's really cool about this one is we have a fat heroine and a fat hero, which is cool to see. And this book is interesting too, because it covers many years of their relationship. They meet and have a one night stand and then end up getting cast opposite each other in this big TV show where they're basically stuck together on a deserted island for six years. And he's like, no, we shouldn't continue a physical relationship because if it goes bad it's gonna mess up our whole vibe while filming but eventually the filming is over and it is time. So uh, it's great. It's smart. It's sexy. I, I loved it. I can gush about these books for hours probably if you let me. Then I read two books for this video project I'd been working on where I was reading and reviewing five horror arcs or advanced reader copies that I had for review. If you haven't seen that video I will link it up above where I talk in more depth about those five books including the two that I'm about to mention here. I'm not going to tell you a ton about them in this video. If you want to hear my detailed thoughts I would go check out that video. First up I read Little Eve by Catriona Ward and she is a polarizing author, I can see why, and I do not think she's probably going to be the author for me. This book was a lot to read. If you need a decent list of content warnings, you can go check out my Goodreads review. Goodreads is always linked down below. I just feel like for a book that is heavily dealing with on-page abuse of children in various forms, I don't feel that she is using the amount of care in portraying it that I would like to see. I mean some people feel differently. You can read what you want to read. Personally if you're going to be dealing with these kinds of topics, especially abuse of children, I don't want to see it used for shock value. I don't want to see it used as a twist. I want to see it handled more carefully. And I think you can do that. I think that there is a way to depict trauma on page, even abuse of children or teenagers on page, and do it well. In fact, a great example of that is the next book that I read for that video. So Little Eve I gave two stars. I was not really a fan of it, but then I read Leech by Hiren Ennis and this was great. This I think is a great example of how you can deal with difficult topics like abuse in a graphic way in a horror novel and do it with care and do it thoughtfully and not just for shock value. I thought that was handled really well in this. This is a weird book but it was so good. I would say if you enjoyed Gideon the Ninth by Tamsin Muir you should definitely check out Leech. The, the, I'm not shocked now having read it the Tamsin Muir blurbed the book because I think there's going to be a lot of crossover in their audiences. This is a gothic sci-fi horror. It has a lot of body horror in it and what's so interesting about it is that it is primarily from the perspective of a doctor who is going to replace another doctor who died under mysterious circumstances. However, in this world doctors are part of a multi-bodied organism like a parasite that has taken over the minds of people that it thinks could be doctors and so yeah it's going to investigate why one of its hosts died under mysterious circumstances and things get 
very weird and very dark. And there's a lot of horror in this book, but it was so good. And it was another one that I gave five stars to. I told you way more five stars this month than what I usually give out. But I yeah, I read some fantastic things. Next, I read The Hollow Places by T. Kingfisher. This is the book club pick for my Patreon book club. So we'll be discussing this at the end of the month. And this was interesting. I, I don't know. I think this book helped me figure something out about my taste in horror. I think generally speaking, when I'm reading horror, I prefer it to either be heavy on social commentary or be really over the top and funny. And this really doesn't do either of those things, which is okay. Not all horror books need to do those things. I just think the reason I didn't have a strong response to this book is probably because of that. I would say The Hollow Places is kind of light horror. If you've read the Narnia books, it's kind of like, what if The Wood Between Worlds existed but was a lot scarier and more dangerous and was found by a divorcee and a gay barista. <laughs> like that's basically what this book is and it's interesting. It is humorous at times. There were parts of it that I really enjoyed but I was never as invested in it as I think I wanted to be and again I think it's just because of what my taste in horror novels is. I did like it though. I gave it three stars and I think now having read three books by T. Kingfisher and having had quite different responses to all of them. I feel like she's just an author who's going to be hit and miss for me that some projects of hers might work for me and others won't. So it makes me want to try samplings of some more things that she's written because I feel like her books can work for me sometimes or maybe not. This one I liked, but I didn't love it. So three stars, but I do think it's going to be an interesting one to discuss at the end of the month. Then I read A Dowry of Blood by S.T. Gibson. I was very kindly sent a finished copy for review from the publisher. This was originally published as an indie book. It kind of took off and then got picked up by Orbit and Red Hook for traditional publications. So if you want to check it out, it's a really lovely book and it even has like a quote under the dust jacket. I thought this was fantastic. I had heard really good things about it and had been interested in picking it up. And yes, I think it is really good. The prose is beautiful. It's very lyrical. And this is so interesting. It's kind of a queer erotic reimagining of Dracula from the perspective of one of his wives. And you begin the book knowing that she has killed her husband. And then the rest of the book is getting us to the point of knowing why. And it's fascinating. It spans hundreds of years, even though it's a pretty short novel, it goes very quickly and a lot happens. Our main character whose head we're in was a young woman in medieval Europe when she was saved from dying of the plague by this vampire lord who introduced her to the pleasures of the flesh and then over time their relationship expands it becomes polyamorous and ultimately I think this is a book about toxic and abusive relationships it's really interesting it's about controlling behavior it's about gaslighting it also I think is trying to talk a little bit about the nuances of consent that just somebody technically verbally agreeing to something isn't really consent the true consent can only happen when it is freely given and enthusiastic. And I think you see a lot of cases in here where our main character feels that she has to say yes to things instead of freely and enthusiastically giving consent. But yeah, I loved it. I thought this was fantastic. It was yet another five star read for me. I swear I don't usually give this many books five stars, but I also am not going to be stingy when I feel like that's what I want to give them. And this was definitely a five star read for me. So I loved it. I thought it was great. It was beautiful. And I'm impressed at how much plot was squeezed into a fairly short novel. The final book that I read in the first half of October is Lavender House by Lev A.C. Rosen. This is really interesting. I don't think it's what I thought it was when I requested it. I knew it was queer because I read something else from this author when he wrote a YA book and I really enjoyed it. But this is quite different. I think in my head I thought this was maybe a historical 
horror, like more horror or something. It's not. It is a historical murder mystery. It is still super queer and it's really interesting, but I am going to tell you there are some very big content warnings for homophobia and homophobia related violence. There are some scenes that are difficult to read. It's set in 1950s San Francisco and our main character is a gay man who had been closeted. He had been working in the police force as a detective and when he was discovered in a gay club he was outed, lost his job, and is now trying to pick back up the pieces when he is hired as a private investigator by a woman who wants the death of her wife investigated. And so he ends up staying at this estate called Lavender House to investigate this death. Now what's really interesting about this is that Lavender House is filled with queer people. They've created it as sort of this safe oasis locked away from the rest of the world where queer people can live their lives even though when they're out in public they are the heads of a soap empire, there are fake marriages of lesbian women marrying gay men so that they can be out in society but secretly be with their partners. But what I think is really interesting and powerful about this this book is that it's unpacking why just being able to privately live the life you want to live can actually be quite traumatic and why that's not enough and why people from this time on until now have continued to fight for rights to live freely, live publicly, have the same rights as everybody else and I think this is really effective in that. Plus it's a murder mystery. I listened to the audiobook, I had it for a review from NetGalley, and I really liked the audio narrator. It gives you all of the like gritty black and white detective drama vibes of like old Hollywood. Camera overheated so I'm not sure exactly where I was talking about Lavender House but I ended up really liking this. It deals with some difficult topics for sure, but then it has this really interesting murder mystery and I liked the way that it resolved. I did guess partway through the book who the culprit was and I was right about it, but I think it does a reasonably good job of keeping us guessing and I think it's doing a lot of interesting setup work for this main character who I am hoping is going to be an ongoing character in a series because the way the book ends, this sets it up where this book easily could turn into a series that is all like queer historical mysteries. Uh, I mean, I'm here for it. I think it sounds great. One thing I am going to say about this is I don't necessarily love the way they did the marketing. They've been comparing this to Knives Out and I don't think that's a good comparison. I think when people think Knives Out, they're expecting something comedic and this is not comedic. In fact, it has quite a number of rather traumatic scenes in it. I think the comparison to Knives Out is the fact that it's following a detective who is investigating the death of a patriarch in a family and like that element of it is Knives Out-ish but if you're going into this expecting something that is more of a dark comedy in the way that Knives Out is, you are not going to get it. So just be aware of what you're getting. But I really enjoyed this. I gave it four and a half stars and rounded up to five on Goodreads. And it is one that I would love to see turn into a series. I would for sure read a series with this character heading it up. So there you go. Those are the 13 things that I read in the first half of October. So far it's been a very strong month. I've read a lot of things I've really enjoyed. I have had some misses which is unfortunate but overall I've had a really great month with way more five star reads than I normally would have in this amount of time. Talk to me in the comments down below. Let me know any of your thoughts or feelings on anything I talked about in this video and for question of the day tell me about an author who is hit and miss for you. I think I talked about that with T. Kingfisher in this book. Who is that author for you? Someone where sometimes you love their books, sometimes they don't really work for you, sometimes they're in between, and it just really varies project to project. Let me know who that is in the comments down below. If you like this video, it always helps if you give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you want to see more. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time.